Tom Geismar is the 26th recipient of SVA's Master Series Award, which SVA founder Silas Rhodes conceived in 1988 to honor the great visual communicators of our time. Why? Because the achievements of many groundbreaking and influential designers, illustrators, art directors, and photographers are well known to their colleagues. But, Unlike famous artists, popular musicians, and performers, the general public essentially has no idea who created so much of what they see and so much of what influences them day to day. It could well be that even tonight in this theater, some of you will learn for the first time that that blue octagon at your Chase ATM, the bright insignia on your local mobile station, the Xerox label on your copier, and the PBS logo on your TV screen all came from the same source. The same elegantly incisive, boldly creative spirit. Well, provoking that aha moment is fundamentally what the Master Series is all about. Connecting that logo on your computer screen that brand in the display window, that book jacket on the store shelf, that magazine cover that cracked you up with the men and the women who made them. And now here to reveal to you much, much more is the 2014 Master Series honoree, one of the truly great visual communicators of our time, Tom Geismar. When Francis told me that I was going to be the recipient of this award and that there'd be an exhibit. I thought, this is over a year ago, I guess. I thought, that'd be great. He said, and then we'll also we'll do a catalog. And I thought, that's great. He said, but you have to give a lecture. I thought, that's not so great. <laughs> um, he said, well, you don't have to actually give a lecture. You could actually have someone ask you questions, and you could just sit there and answer the questions. And I said, well, no, I think. I'd rather do it alone, that's how I usually do it. Um, but actually, I've sort of ended up in between. I'm going to ask the questions and then answer them. <laughs> um, I found that I've um, been interviewed a lot recently, and the same questions keep coming up from different interviewers. So I've actually taken questions that have been posed to me in the past couple of years, and uh, use those as the basis of, of this talk, uh, and then gave me the chance at least to prepare something in response to those questions. So that's, that's the, uh, the process we're going to try. So here's the first question. And this one comes up every time, all the time. Um, and it's a good thing, I think, to, to, to start with, um, because Ivan and I have been uh, partners now for 57 years. Uh, this is a few years ago. Um, I think our longevity can perhaps be summed up in one word, which is trust. Uh, it's a lot like a marriage. Uh, we respect each other's judgments and taste. Um, and our very different personalities mesh well together. We've also share priorities. And while these priorities have evolved over the years, they really haven't diverged. Uh, and they have been a major factor in all kinds of decisions about structure, about personnel, and most importantly, about the kind of work we do. But also, our partnership has almost always been more than just the two of us. The idea of collaboration has been an essential feature of our office from the outset, and we've been fortunate to work side by side with some extremely talented partners over the years. Robert Brownjohn was our initial third partner. Steph Geisbuehler, who's here tonight, and John Grady were essential parts of our office for 30 years. And today, uh, Sagi Haviv, who's here tonight, has brought great new energy and proven to be a very talented partner who has taken over much responsibility for the work in our office. He's the one on the right, in case you didn't know. Uh, I have another long-term partnership. 
this one with Joan. We've been married exactly one year less than my office partnership. Uh, we've shared priorities, and they play an important role here too, as well as, of course, as love and sharing a wonderful family, some of whom are also here tonight. So next question, how'd you become a designer? Who were your early influences? This again is on every, every question. Uh, but one note before we get into that. Um, as designers, at least as we see design, our, our concern is sharing problems and we work together to solve really other people's problems. Uh, designers work for clients and these clients can have a profound effect on the quality of the work produced. And on certain large projects, especially exhibitions, designers often work closely with outside collaborators also, such as architects. So tonight, in giving my responses to things, uh, I really want to highlight some of those collaborators, both clients and colleagues outside of our office, who had a vision and who were willing to take a chance to stave off the unbelievers, and as a consequence, had a significant effect on our work. This isn't usually done, and I just thought it'd be a nice time to, uh, to do that in looking back here. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, in suburban New Jersey, and when I was five, my grandparents came to live with us. My grandfather had lost uh, his business in the Depression, and uh, this was not unusual at that time. I guess even my aunt came to live with us, too, in a small house. And my grandfather, with no training whatsoever, took up painting. And this is a painting he did in 1937. I, I think mostly what he did, and I'm not sure, were copies of things, but without any training, he actually had talent uh, with the brush and, uh, and so on. And we have drawings and so on that he did. Fortunately, he died before I was 10, so I never really had that much uh, relationship beyond that. But I wanted to show you something else. Um, I found this book when I was a teenager, and it had the title Graphic Design, but I had never heard that phrase before. Uh, and graphic design was not taught anywhere. There, were, there was no such thing, basically, as graphic design. Uh, but this book um, was written by Leon Friend and Joseph Hefter. There's someone here who knows a lot about that. And was first published in 1936. And many years later, after I became a designer, I learned that Leon Friend had been the chairman of the art department at Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn. He called his class graphic design, which he saw as a very inclusive activity. Uh, his students drew and painted, uh, they took photographs, they designed posters and composed magazine and book pages. And out of that single high school came an enormous number of famous designers, photographers, and what have you. Among them, uh, Jean Federico, Alex Steinweiss, Seymour Quast, Bill Taubin, photographers Irving Penn, Jay Maisel, the film director Arthur Penn. It, it's a huge list. And Richard Wilde, who is here tonight, who was the chairman for the last 40 years of the graphic design department at SVA, is another graduate of this program, as is Sheila de Bretville, the head of the design, uh, graphic design program at Yale. And it's just, a, it's an amazing thing that out of this one high school came all these people. I don't think there was something in the water there. I don't, I don't know what it was, but obviously it was the teacher, this one teacher. So the talent is everywhere. It's just a matter of bringing it out, obviously. And this, I was intrigued by the book because it showed all these illustrations of different kinds of graphic arts. And again, he saw graphic arts and or graphic design in, in a kind of broad pattern, and there were a lot of European things in it, which again, I had never, never seen. We didn't have the internet in those days. I knew I was interested in art, but my father wanted me to study economics. So I ended up at Brown 
and I went there because I had heard that it was next door to Rhode Island School of Design, which it was, or is. Uh, the only thing is that Rhode Island School of Design, there was no course on graphic design. Uh, the closest thing was something on advertising art, which is a very minimal program, but I spent a lot of time drawing and uh, painting and essentially went to both schools, which was sort of great for me because I could choose what courses I wanted to have at uh, Rhode Island School of Design. When I was about to graduate from Brown, a professor, a drawing professor at Brown Island School of Design told me that a new program had started at Yale and there was a program on graphic design there. I knew nothing about this, but it sounded interesting. I applied and was accepted for it. And um, at the time, of course, this was the program that Joseph Albers had been brought in to sort of revive the very old art school at Yale, but sort of moribund at that point. And he, in turn, appointed Alvin Eisenman on the left there, who uh, was the designer and typographer at the Yale University Press at the time and was in his early 30s. Uh, Yale, for me, was... Uh, a life-changing event. It opened up a whole new world of possibilities. For faculty, Alvin brought in the leading designers of the day, including Alvin Lustig, Leo Leone, Alexei Brodovich, Lester Beale, Bradbury Thompson, Herbert Matter, and Paul Rand. Uh, Alvin was the ringmaster of all this. Um, he uh, juggled schedules, assignments, egos, and expectations, beautifully. He liked to say, amaze me. And it was in my second year at Yale that I met Ivan, uh, and Alvin assigned us thesis problems that were very related, and that's really how we got to know each other. Um, in the mid-1950s, the Korean War was slowly winding down, but there was still a draft, and soon after graduation, I was drafted into the Army. I heard a rumor that the Army had a unit that designed and built exhibits about, for example, the wonders of ordnance. Uh, I submitted my portfolio like you would do for a job, and I was, after some bureaucracy, was assigned to this unit. And I spent most of the next two years at a base in Alexandria, Virginia, designing exhibits with a wonderful group of artists, architects, and designers. I guess they also heard the rumor. In the spring of 1957, a couple of months before my discharge, I received a letter from Ivan asking if I would like to join him and another designer in forming a new design firm. I said, sure, why not? I had no other plans, and thus began a partnership that I've been part of ever since. Our idea was to base the office, this is uh, at that tough duty in the Army. Uh, our idea was to base the office on an architectural practice, a collaboration of the three of us. That other partner was Robert Brownjohn, here on the left. Uh, and our new firm was named Brown John, Chermayev, and Geismar. We were basing that on, you know, like Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. I mean, we, we were big time. Um, the name is quite a mouthful. And a year or so later, BJ, as he was known, designed a poster commemorating the often badly mangled name on the mail we received. Here are just a few details of that. <laughs> We had an enormous collection. <laughs> BJ was six years older than Ivan and I. He had been schooled in the experimental and multidisciplinary tradition of the European avant-garde at the Institute of Design in Chicago, where La Laszlo Maholi Nagy had become something of a father figure to him and greatly influenced his approach. BJ's ability to engage in a wide range of disciplines came from his belief that concept was everything. 
He was charming, witty, and proud of what he called his steel trap mind. These are a couple of things he did. This, this uh, we, were, we used to do a lot of book jackets and record album covers at the time, and uh, this, we got the assignment to do this, uh, this book, and BJ looked down, and he had a blotter on his desk. He used to doodle all the time. He said, that's it. And he literally ripped off the blotter from his desk, and that's the book jacket. And, and we did a lot of things. Our big client was Pepsi-Cola, and it's a long story why. But, uh, and they had just moved into this building on Park Avenue, 500 Park Avenue, still there. And they had nothing to, to put in the lobby. So we used to design exhibits and curate exhibits and whatever. And then every holiday season had to do something to you know, catch the spirit. So this is 10,000 Christmas balls on this, uh, this display one, uh, one holiday season. Um, you know, BJ and I shared a room together. We faced each other, and it was a great experience. It was my first real job, and he was so smart and tough-minded. Ideas were always the most important thing, and he was brilliant at recognizing as well as developing new concepts. Unfortunately, unknown to Ivan and me, BJ had been a heroin addict. And when his need resurfaced a couple years later, the situation really became untenable. And in 1960, BJ left the firm and moved to London, where at that time the drug could be legally obtained. BJ became a famous character in the swinging 60s of London. Uh, he produced album covers for the Rolling Stones, and famously designed the title sequence for the first James Bond films. Um, one of the last pieces that BJ ever did was a poster for a peace campaign. It hangs today in our conference room. The poster features the Ace of Spades with PE scribbled before it and a question mark after it. And in the lower left, it's signed, Love, BJ. The unpredictability of the question mark, the use of the death card, and the intimate sign-off are an eerie premonition of his death in mysterious circumstances very soon after. One other thing about that time was that there were so few graphic designers, we were all friends, and we used to do things together. And one thing was we, we five, six of us gathered to make trips around the city photographing sort of the, the vernacular signage and everything that was all, that was all around. And then we had, a, for this drawing was done by a boardwalk artist in Coney Island, paid him five bucks if he would do all of us. And so you have Tony Palladino on the left, then uh, George Cherney, then Brown John, bad picture of him, then me, then Ivan, and then Bob Gill. Uh, and we used to go around and photograph all this garbage, I mean, around, which we thought was really interesting. That was something, you know, very much of the time, I think, or of those times. Okay, what is the attraction for you of designing logos? Well, I've always been attracted to reductive design, trying to find the essence of an idea, and then trying to find an imaginative way to express it. That approach is quite relevant to logo design, especially the design of symbols and marks. And each mark, however, is just really the end result of an extensive process that includes an in-depth analysis of the issues involved and a thorough exploration of various possible design concepts. In all cases, the goal is to develop a mark that is distinctive and memorable, that is appropriate to the client, and that is workable in a full range of sizes and media. Those are not necessarily easy goals to achieve. What do you consider to be your most extensive influential project? Well, I think without doubt, and I think Ivan would probably uh, 
agree with this. Um, we spent 30 years, over 30 years, working for mobile, doing all kinds of things. We were their official graphic design consultants, and it was a very interesting and, and terrific experience for us, actually. And uh, so I, I, I think I would definitely name that. But just to give you a little history of, of this, mobile was not called mobile. Mobile was a product. Mobile oil was a product. Uh, it was Sacconi Vacuum Oil Company, and, and even when we were brought in in mid-1960s, it was still not Mobile, Mobile Oil Corporation. But these were some of the marks they had used, most recently the one on the right with the emblem. And they had design guidelines for it and uh, everything. Um, but this was a time when there was this huge exodus to the suburbs. We're talking about you know, post-war America in the 50s and the 60s, uh, and all these developments were being made and all these housing uh, things, all of which featured, you know, a garage, a one or two car garage, because, I mean, you had to have a car to live in the suburbs, and, uh, and those cars drank a lot of gasoline, and it was just part of that, uh, you know, that period of time. And mobile service stations were horrible, as were everyone else's, by the way, it wasn't just them but they were painted in garish colors. They were full of banners hanging and tires wrapped in foil and whatever. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that letter got reversed there. But <laughs> and, oh, and everything was painted a bright color. Everything was to stand out. And also at the time, uh, the technology was such that any grade of gasoline had to have its own pump. Now we have, you know, three grades or whatever in one pump, but at that time, everything had a separate pump. Um, and their ads were just as bad. Um, Raleigh Warner, who died a year ago in 92, as this obituary states, uh, the obituary in the Times said, Raleigh Warner, brash mobile executive, dies at 92. Um, Raleigh Warner, was in his mid-40s and about to become the CEO of this giant company at the time. And he recognized that this situation offered a, a real chance for mobile, that if they could do something that was much more attractive in terms of their service stations, they would be invited by zoning boards into these communities that were now couldn't stand having, they needed gasoline stations, but they were all horrible and they were trying to hide them away and everything. So he figured if they could do something much better, uh, that would be a great advantage to the company as well as a, a good gesture. So Raleigh uh, went to Elliot Noyes. Elliot Noyes had been in charge of the IBM program, which was very famous at the time. He was the original director of the uh, architecture and design section at MoMA. And Elliot, in turn, recommended us to look at the graphics uh, for mobile. So we worked very closely together on this, of coming up with a proposal. And this is actually what we presented to the mobile board. It was one idea, um, but was very carefully thought out. And part of the idea that Elliot had was to have canopies. Well, there were no canopies at that time, because there was no self-service. But he thought at least keep the attendant dry, and it would add some focus on the forecourt of the station, and then to play down the building, not have it bright blue and horses flying off of it and everything, and to use circles as a, as a theme. So the round canopies, the pumps were made round, uh, other equipment was made round, uh, and so on. And that was you know, the proposal as it was presented. Now our part of it, of course, was to do the logo. Uh, and one of the reasons for the O, being emphasized was this idea of roundness being a key uh, theme, if you will, but also to make the word be pronounced correctly because a lot of people said mobile and put the emphasis on the O sort of helped uh, have it pronounced correctly. We also did an alphabet, a special alphabet for them, um, which we only had in one, so one weight to be used everywhere for headlines, signs, and so on, which was quite unusual at the time. And this is actually the first station that was built. This is in New Haven, Connecticut, 1965. 
uh, which shows the basic elements of it, that the building is made much more neutral, that the only colors are in important things, the signs, and so on, and you see the round canopies. Um, this is another early station that was done at that, uh, that time. Uh, and these are some of the examples of the round pumps and the round oil carousels, as they called them. Uh, we did the packaging design and new packages, new, new products, and so on. And this all went extremely well for them, and they were able to get the rights to be in many of these new communities, and the, and the company grew very rapidly at that time. Uh, we continued to work with them, and 20 years later, the technology had changed, and the laws had changed, because now there was self-service, uh, and these integrated pumps and so on. So again, working with the noise office, um, we developed new stations which picked up on a lot of the themes of the earlier one, but now the round canopies were gone and there was a circular lighted area within a rectangular canopy because it was less expensive. Um, but again, they were very clean and all the basic elements originally proposed were still there and the use of color and the use of neutral colors for the buildings and neutral materials, uh, the use of bright colors only for the most important messages. You had to have a red or blue car to go to mobile stations, I think. Um, and one of the indications uh, of Warner's interest, and everyone knew he was interested, which meant a lot in that company, is when we first did these uh, blue uh, spandrels over these new, new pumps, he called me one day and he said, Tom, I'm just wondering, I just saw the new spandrel over the pump there and I wonder, should the horse be in the middle rather than over to the left? And I said, no, well, because it's really, you know, it's flying that way and I don't know, I mean, maybe he was right, I don't know, but <laughs> I said, no, it was right the way it was and he said, fine, that's great, I just wanted to know what you thought. I mean, there aren't many chief executives of major corporations who would take that interest and do that. And everyone knew this, and he made sure everyone knew he was interested. So, and he would travel around the world through all their facilities, and they all knew he was coming, so they had to clean up their act. And it was amazingly effective. The other thing he did was actually make us legally a part of, of the company. We were on you know, the charts and everything as, as consultants, noise office as architectural consultants, and we as graphic design consultants. And then they set up a department to sort of coordinate with us. So it was all very official. So when he finally left office and other CEOs came in, they just continued this process. Um, and we, for, for example, these are some guidelines we did. And again, just the basic elements. We just said it's the, it's the logo. It's this alphabet. It's the way the horse is now in a, in a circular disc. And it's the use of color, which we were very specific about when you used what kind of colors. And, and mobile also, in trying to project themselves, as a very different kind of company. And you know, people question this, but we thought they really, they, they wanted to be out there and express their views, and whether you agree with them or not, at least to be open about it what they felt. So they, for example, were the first ones to do advertisements on op-ed pages, uh, paid advertisements in the lower right corner to really state their views on various issues of the day. They did a lot of advertising, not for products, but really for safety. Uh, this was just one that uh, Doyle Dane Birnbach did, and they were quite brilliant. And then they had, you know, product billboards and everything, but everything, again, used this alphabet. I mean, it was very, you know, interesting, imaginatively done, but very uh, controlled. And at the same time, uh, we were, they were sponsoring Masterpiece Theater, many, many shows on PBS, many exhibits at various museums around, uh, especially around the city. Uh, Ivan must have done 100 posters for these different things. This is one of them for a, a television show. Uh, we also did things around at all their facilities. So this is a giant part of an O at their headquarters at that time down in Fairfax, Virginia. And also we're in charge of 
commissioning and purchasing the artwork for all their offices around the world. And Ivan basically, basically did that, and that was a huge, huge task. Uh, this is again in at Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, this is a Dubuffet. But we also commissioned many, many things, especially for their places. So it was a very all-encompassing thing. When they merged with Exxon in the mid-90s, that was sort of the end of our involvement. We really didn't want to be involved anymore. We felt it was a very different culture and not appropriate. And the interesting thing is, this aside, when you go to a service station today, it's exactly the same as it was in 1984. They've done nothing basically since, uh, which is a shame. Uh, you have designed logos for many aquariums. If any of you saw the exhibit, you recognize that. Uh, how come, and how do you make them different? Well, there's a very simple reason of how come. It's this guy. Uh, this is Ivan's brother, Peter Chemayev, who is an architect who designs aquariums. <laughs> and uh, so what he does, we get to do the graphics for them, and sometimes the exhibits. And Peter is a terrific aquarium designer. These are just some quick picks from uh, some of his things. But he, he really has an incredible understanding of the fish and, and water. And what's been interesting, um, these are jellyfish, by the way, and they're incredible, um, is that he, he's one of those people who has a very clear concept of what he wants to do. And every one of the aquariums is really quite different in concept. And so that's what's made it easy, if you will, to design a mark because th they are different. They really are. Uh, the first one we did was actually in, in Boston, the New England Aquarium. And uh, this is really was a, sort of a more normal aquarium, though it's since been expanded greatly, especially in this last year. So basically a fish and water. Uh, but the, and this is how it looked originally, uh, the next major one was in, is, is in Baltimore, the National Aquarium uh, in Baltimore on the harbor. And uh, here, the whole theme was to be fish and water. I mean, water covers, what, 95% of our planet, and it's certainly become even more of an issue uh, these days. So there's much there about water as there is about sea life. And uh, so the symbol was really a kind of figure ground uh, of water and fish idea. And you know, at times, for example, for the construction fence, we just continued that pattern uh, all around. Originally, it was called Baltimore Aquarium. And uh, then they got it named the National Aquarium in Baltimore by taking over what was the so-called National Aquarium in Washington, which is really a very small a small place. Uh, and one other, just to show you, because there have been a number, is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. All these buildings, by the way, because of what they are, basically are un there are no windows because they have to be dark spaces and controlled spaces. So it's always a question of what you do uh, with these uh, facades. And usually there's a rainforest or something uh, on, the, on the top. But this has been an enormously successful aquarium. But this one is essentially about Tennessee because there are more species of fish in Tennessee than almost anywhere else in the world. And so I had this idea of doing a logo that got through that idea because there's this great river that runs through and then all these tributaries that come into it so that you have the, the bold white line you know, representing the river which winds through the other lighter white lines representing uh, all the tributaries and streams and other rivers. And then you have not only fish, but also birds and other kinds of wildlife all coming together to form one thing. So this was very sp specifically for this, uh, for this aquarium. What's an example of a logo that evolved from an existing mark rather than something completely new? We, we often have this. I just thought maybe to show you one very quickly uh, that you'll recognize. Um, this was the PBS logo in the early 80s, and it was designed by a very good designer, Herb LeBallon. Uh, the problem that they had was that people created it with, say, CBS, which is a system 
you know, it, it owns all these stations and provides the money to the stations and so on, whereas PBS means public broadcasting service, and it doesn't provide almost any money to the stations. The stations have to raise their own funds. Uh, and so they felt that by using these initials this way and relying completely on the initials, it, it was deceptive for the stations, which had to do all their own fundraising. So we had a very simple idea. We took that P, we turned it around, then we gave it a lobotomy and a nose job and a little neck job there, because uh, it no longer had to be a P, um, to become that. And then did this, so it becomes not every man, but every person, really. And our idea at the time was to really say public TV rather than PBS. They did it for a while, but everyone still called it PBS and knew it, so it eventually went back to, uh, to being PBS. But it, it was just an interesting taking of something that was there before and making something new out of it. And uh, these were just some of the materials that were sent out when they first, uh, first did it. What lessons have you learned? Well, I mean, I guess we've learned a lot of lessons, but one lesson that is, has been so meaningful to us uh, was learned very early on, and I thought I'd just tell you that one. Um, the Chase Manhattan Bank was a merger of the Chase National Bank and the Bank of the Manhattan Company. And Chase had a map of the US, but then when they merged, they figured they were gonna be a worldwide bank, so they added the globe. And then to make sure people understood, they added worldwide banking. And the, part of the problem here was that they were building this building down on Wall Street, which was to be the first sort of modern skyscraper in the Wall Street area, a 60-story building, which is known up to the last year or so as Chase Manhattan Plaza. And it seemed inappropriate to have that mark on there. At the time, there was a triumvirate that was running the bank. Uh, John McCloy, in the middle there, was the chairman. He had been the ex-high commissioner of Germany after the war and was a pretty crusty old lawyer. Uh, on the lower right is George Champion, who was the president. And David Rockefeller, at the lower left, was really third in command, though everyone felt that someday he would be in command. Anyhow, he was responsible for the design of the building and everything, and, and for hiring us. And between us, we thought, there is no symbol of banking. You know, what, what do you do? A dollar sign or something? I don't know. No one's ever had one. So why couldn't Chase, which was then, I think, the second biggest bank in the country and had ads in the newspaper every day, uh, had great exposure, branches all over. Couldn't they establish any kind of mark, an abstract mark even, as their symbol? And we showed that there, are, there were a few others around that people recognized. The one some people don't recognize is in the upper right, and that was Alcoa Aluminum at the time. Um, so we did a lot of different uh, sort of marks, but this one sort of came to the forefront. These were just looking at vari variations on it that we had. This was the recommendation. And when we presented it to the three of them, with David Rockefeller, who knew you know, what, what it was going to be, uh, these two guys were not happy. Uh, Ch Champion said, well, can't it be like the sculpture we're commissioning out front? And... Uh, David Rockefeller said, well, you know, it may be a call there, and it's sort of going to look like a spider, and do we really want a spider as our symbol? And um, McCloy said, eventually, uh, let me just get to him, I think. Um, David, you call the shot here. This has been your project, but I just want to tell you, I don't want to see it on my letterhead, I don't want to see it on my business card. I don't want to see it in my office. I don't want to see it. <laughs> so the bank adopted the symbol, and uh, it started being placed around. This is the lobby at uh, Chase Manhattan Plaza. And again, it was so simple that this, these are stainless steel bars making up the symbol. Uh, up on Park Avenue at a, their big uptown 
branch. You know, we did a three-dimensional version on the wall behind the tellers. I mean, again, by being so simple, it could be shown in many different ways. Um, six months later, we ran into McCloy uh, at the bank. He was wearing a tie tack with the symbol on it, <laughs> holding a tie with a pattern of the symbol on it, and a pin in his lapel with the symbol on it. So obviously, what had happened is it no longer was a, a, an abstract design. It was now the symbol of the mark of the bank. And it's a bank he was very proud of. And so he was wearing it. And it's, it's so hard. I mean, we always find it so difficult to convey that to people. Um, it's, it's a lesson that um, keeps coming up. And we tell this story all the time because we thought it might do some good. I'm not sure it, it does, because we tell people it's not what you like, it's what works. Uh, and they said, yes, yes, yes. And then they said, but I don't like blue, you know, or something. <laughs> so anyhow, it's been interesting, uh, you know, as, in terms of the bank, it's now gone through two or three managements. It's been mergers and everything. The, the only thing that's remained are the symbol and the name Chase. Uh, but it, it's been a long time. Uh, and recently, there was this whole confab over Airbnb, Airbnb rather, uh, and when they came out with a new logo, which we had nothing to do with, just a couple weeks ago, hundreds, thousands of people started doing their own sketches of it and you know what it meant, and they were pretty vulgar, most of them. Uh, and it's with uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and all those things, it's so easy for people and so many people seem to really enjoy, you know, this kind of snide uh, thing. And so they were inundated for a week. And then, of course, everyone forgot about it, and they went on to make fun of something else, I guess. And Airbnb went along. But I also realized that, it, and we've talked about this many times, that it's very difficult for people to accept change, to accept something new. And one great example which I came across um, is that in Paris, in the late 1800s, 300 writers, artists, sculptors put their names to a, a, a protest letter in a major Parisian newspaper, which said in part this. And this was, you know, Guy de Maupassant and Alexandre Dumas, and it was really all the leading figures in French uh, culture at that, uh, at that time. So I guess it's nothing new. What do you consider to be your best professional experience? Well, it's always so hard on these things to separate, you know, the experience itself with design and so on. But for me, it was designing Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan. Uh, the government asked for teams as a competition. And so we teamed ourselves with the architects, Davis Brody, uh, and the designer, Rudy DeHarrick, to come up with a, a proposal, a design proposal. Uh, and we did, and we won. The proposal was not what this is, what it ended up being, but we had won the, the competition. And this is a really interesting building done in kind of record time where the earth was dug out and then it's an air inflated roof. This was the first big air inflated roof. It's what led to all the dome stadiums in the country. Um, and the cables actually don't support the roof when it's up. They support it if it collapses, because we have to be uh, have to withstand typhoons and hurricanes and so on. Uh, so it was just a big open space. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but all those all those little black things around are people actually waiting in line. Um, here I was jumping on the roof, which was like a great trampoline at the time. And on opening day, it was just inundated. And it turned out that the Japanese were not used to revolving doors, which is something that had never occurred to us. And so they kept having to change the revolving doors because they were just pushing through them. But uh, the building was a great success. 
Inside, during the day, it was beautifully daylighted through that fabric, the fiberglass fabric of the roof. And we sort of divided up responsibilities. I was responsible for two exhibits. One was the American folk art. And this is just one small part where we had weather vanes out uh, on the sides there, those mylar covered berms. Those kind of gun emplacements there are actually the air inlets to keep the roof up. Um, and we borrowed things from all great museums. There had never been a uh, exhibit like this of American folk art in Asia. And, and the Japanese, they're such great craftsmen and everything that they really love this. When we opened up the cases, the crates with some of these uh, masks, Native American masks, some of the workmen actually knew which tribes they were from, which astounded us. But we had, you know, tombstone carvings and uh, carvings, you know, cigar store Indians, so-called, and, and all kinds of shaker, big shaker room and whatever. But the biggest uh, exhibit, single exhibit, was about space. And this is less than a year after Neil Armstrong and his crew walked on the moon. So it's a little hard now, some, what, 45 years later, to understand the excitement at the time, and especially in Japan. So we managed to get from NASA all real things, uh, no fakes, no models, and whatever. So this, for example, is Apollo 12. Well, Apollo 11 is the one that landed on the moon. This is Apollo 12, which was the next one. You can see the burn marks for when it came back and, uh, into the atmosphere and so on. And we had all kinds of things. This, uh, this guy is actually standing on a full-size recreation of the, I think it's called the Sea of Tranquility, which is the area of the moon where uh, it landed. Uh, and there's a moon lander behind him. Uh, and I always was sort of amused by this because these guys in hats looking at guys in hats, I mean, it's sort of, uh, who's the strangest? Uh, and we even had, you know, the actual molded seats that the astronauts uh, used to, uh, uh, to fit themselves. But the biggest hit, and the biggest hit in the whole fair was this piece of rock which is actually a moon rock. And people lined up for hours to see this. We treated it as a piece of precious jewelry, um, but it was incredibly popular with the, the Japanese audience. Um, I, I need to break in here and describe the guy on the left there. He refused to come tonight, but his wife is here. Um, his name is Jack Macy. Uh, he's there with the American ambassador in the middle and Mrs. Khrushchev on the right. And they're, as it says, visiting U.S. Art Show. Well, that art show was a show called Graphic Arts USA, which we designed in 1963 as part of a cultural exchange program with the Soviet Union. And this was our first exposure to Jack Jack was the director of design for the United States Information Agency. And um, he, in his own way, somehow managed to get things done that were unbelievable and of a quality and an imagination that, uh, I don't know how to describe it because when you meet Jack, you, you, you know, just like he wouldn't come tonight. Um, he was very behind the scenes. But he was responsible for this graphic art show. He was responsible for the Osaka show, which I just showed you. He was responsible for the Buckminster Fuller Pavilion and all our designs for the Montreal World's Fair. Uh, and for the US Bicentennial, he was the design director uh, in the US. And then when he retired, he moved to New York and took space in our office, and he's been there ever since. Uh, and so subsequent to that, we have done many exhibits with Jack as a collaborator. So we designed the new Statue of Liberty Museum with Jack. We designed all the Ellis Island exhibits with Jack. We designed the Truman Library with Jack. He's just been an integral part of uh, our lives for, for a long time. And somehow, um, 
he was really responsible for making these things things a su success. We never had any of the criticism, and the stuff, especially in the government projects. And you know, years later, he'll show us the letters he received from congressmen and other people of just, you know, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. How can America picture itself that way? And so on and so forth. We never saw it. This, by the way, is uh, the crew. Richard, you know some of these people. Um, uh, working hard on planning uh, Expo 70 in Japan. I think I took the picture, so I'm not in it. That's Ivan on the left in his dress. What long-term project or client gave you the most freedom? Um, this man is named David Teeger. Um, David is an entrepreneur, he's a business leader, he's a major art collector, and for me, a longtime friend and client. Uh, we grew up in the same locale and have, I believe, been working together in one way or another since the late 1960s. Like Peter Chermayev and his aquariums, David usually has a very clear concept of what he wants to achieve, and he's always allowed me great freedom to determine what to do to help achieve that goal. At some point in the 1980s, David purchased a small consulting company with, I think, 12 employees. A dance enthusiast, and, and David took out full-page ads in various dance programs and wanted the company to stand out from all the other ads, most, almost all of which featured a black and white photograph, beautiful photograph of a dancer. So I just did a series of very simple kind of abstract things that suggested dance, but really stood out in the context of where they appeared. Around 1990, um, David merged his company with another company, and we renamed it Gemini, because of the two stars and the two companies and, and so on, Gemini Consulting. Uh, over the next few years, they built that into the fastest growing management consulting company in the world and soon had 3,500 professional employees as opposed to the 12 that they started out with. But these are just, David always wanted something different uh, and something that was provocative, if you will. So I just wanted to show you a few things that we did uh, for Gemini, for, for David. Th th this is when they first did it, and this is actually a, a history of Gemini and the idea of Gemini and the twin stars and all different cultures as a kind of fold-out. Uh, one thing uh, David insisted on is that in their offices, the only artwork would be Saul Steinberg drawings. And th th he just made photo prints out of books and blew them up large, but they were... Uh, prevalent everywhere there, and he felt they had such meaning, and it's true, I mean, you know, but is really gonna stop yes here, right? No question about it. Um, he asked us to do a series of ads for Fortune. I, they had made some kind of trade-off and that could appear in business magazines like Fortune and Forbes. So, and, and David always liked uh, quotes. He's always big on quotes. So. We did this series of, uh, of ads. I particularly like this quote, or I find it appropriate for me. But, um, and we treated them this way. We treated the type this way uh, and, uh, to make it very special. They ended up being the highest read ads in, in every publication they were in. And it was a long seri a series that went on for a few years, actually. It didn't say anything about how great they were or anything. It just, the quotes, however, were relevant to the world that they, uh, they were in. Uh, we also, he also asked us to do a recruiting book. And we did this um, book, which, and we did a lot of things with images of the sky, though they became very abstract at times, but because of the whole idea of Gemini and so on, we thought it was an appropriate theme. And, and the interior of the books looked like this, where we highlighted, again, as in the ads, copy and, and brought out different things. David was very proud of this, and he loved to tell them the story. Of, uh, they had a bunch of Baker scholars from the Harvard Business School come to see whether they wanted to work there or whether they wanted them. And he asked his recruiters to give everyone a copy of this. 
and then ask them if they liked it or not. And he said, if they don't like it, don't hire them. <laughs> uh, and, and for new recruits, they built a training center uh, designed by uh, the architect Michael Rotundi. Uh, and this is in a kind of normal building in Morristown, New Jersey, but they completely redid the interior for this. And one of the issues is, what do you do when someone first comes in? What do we do to make it something different? So those rocks there in the middle are actually slabs of foam that we carved in our office as seats. And when the new recruits come in the first time, each one has to take one, and that becomes their seat. Uh, they take it, and at the end of the day, they come back and put them back on the pile. I don't know, that was me sitting on some of the rocks in our office. Uh, this was you know, in their cafeteria where they were segregating uh, garbage, really, and dividing it between cans, um, trash, and paper goods. So we did collages, and we did a number of things. This is one of them uh, that signified it without saying what the difference was. So we just made these collages of both real and, in this case, some fake food. Uh, to indicate, but again, it was always the idea of trying to get people to think freshly, to think differently, which makes a lot of sense for a management consulting firm. We also did a lot of things for David personally, and he asked Michael Rotondi to design a new house for him in Morristown, and he did a beautiful house, which took many years to build and whatever, and in that time, David decided to build up a collection of American folk sculpture to use in the house, throughout the house. So he, he put together one of the outstanding collections in the country of that material. And when we saw it, I said, gee, David, why don't we make a book of this? Uh, it's so beautiful. So he said, sure, let's do that. So we made this book, which is a very oversized book, beautifully printed. Uh, and it's all photographs of the sculpture. There are no captions, no page numbers, or anything here. Uh, all the photographs were taken in his garage or in his front lawn, actually, and set up a complete studio, and uh, did all kinds of you know different things to to really bring out the texture and the form and the quality. So these, for example, are the uh, the tails of a number of his horse weather vanes that he had of all different materials, shapes, and sizes, or both sides of a of a cow, uh, or scale differences uh, for this angel. Uh, and then in the back of the book was a pullout which gave all the provenance and everything else of every piece, the dates, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So you could actually take that out and hold it next to the page if you were really interested in the factual details about each piece. Uh, just one other thing I've done for David over the years is uh, are holiday cards, and uh, it, it's always up to me, what do you do? And so we've gone through a number of different ideas. I just want to show you a couple of them. So this was one where uh, all those kind of abstract shapes on the cover are actually all the shapes that make up the words on the inside for each line. Um, but then we started doing quotes, because again, David loved quotes. So this is a quote uh, from Marc Chagall, actually. All colors are the friends of their neighbors and the lovers of their opposites. This is a Matisse quote. There are, layer, there are always flowers for those who want to see them. So I've tried to do things differently, you know, typographically and so on. Recently, I went through all the art quotes I could find, so just doing other kinds of quotes. So this is one from uh, a year or so ago, which always strikes me as an interesting <laughs> notion. They say the quality in a game of chess is not in the move, but in the elegance of the thought behind it. Can you give an example of this? Well, I'm not quite sure what the question means, but there's one piece that... Uh, I've always liked the idea of it very much. Um, in, in the mid-1980s, uh, we were asked, many designers were asked to do a poster commemorating the 40th anniversary of the bombing 
of Hiroshima. And many people used, you know, it's kind of violent war imagery and so on. Um, I tried to do something else. Um, and this is a photograph of my daughter Pamela's hand when she was 17 years old. Uh, it's very detailed, more so even than you see here. Because I thought that the upraised palm suggests both peace and stop as a gesture, but also in the highly detailed folds and markings of her young hand, it also suggests the uniqueness and the sanctity of every human life. So I, I like that idea as a, a, another way to look at that issue. Uh, and lastly, after a lifetime in design, would you choose to be a designer in the present landscape? Well, it's always asked and I'm never quite sure how to answer it, except I would say that I feel very fortunate to have spent my entire working life as a graphic designer and being part of a small organization where I could interact with very talented partners. As an independent designer, or whether on your own or part of a firm, one is exposed to many different people involved in a wide range of activities. And if curious, you can learn a great deal. Today, the field is much broader than it was when we started, and it's certainly more competitive. Yet the opportunities are great for someone who is curious about the world, interested in, design, in, in defining and solving problems, and passionate about design. So uh, I think it's getting to be dinner time. And just want to remind you, for those who haven't seen it, the, the exhibit is still at the SVA gallery uh, on 26th Street, uh, between 11th and 12th Avenue through the end of next week. Thank you very much. Many years ago, after graduating SVA, my first job was at DDB and I worked on mobile. And of course, we were given a brand book and guidelines, and it was quite easy to follow, being most of the work was print or outdoor. Being today, your work is ubiquitous and repurposed in many ways. How do you feel when out of the corner of your eye you see something isn't done to the standard it should be? <laughs> and does it happen often? Sure it does. <laughs> I mean, Chase is a perfect example. I mean, they, they, we, I counted on one branch bank, they had 12 different logos on the facade. Uh, yeah, it's sort of like your children, you know, you see them getting in trouble and you get, uh, you get upset. Um, but on the other hand, you sometimes see, I mean, uh, the opposite of that to me is on PBS because they ended up putting the, you know, the, the every person symbol into a, into a disc and using it. And I think it's, they did a terrific job with that. So it varies, but it hurts. Okay. When you think about all designs that you've done over the course of years, is it, is it one design or a series of designs that you, you've done and you looked at it and said, I could have taken that further into design development? Well, yeah, I mean, there probably is, but we actually, and I tried to allude to this without getting into it, that um, we really explore pretty extensively, you know, what the options are, uh, at least what we have in mind at the time, and we look at an awful lot of things before, you have to end up with one thing, I mean, basically, but to get to that point, we do a lot of research, we do a lot of interviews of people, and we do an enormous number of uh, sketches and ideas. I, in the exhibit, I, there's one case where I put the sketches of, for one logo, and you can see it's a, a big case uh, that were done. So, sure, I mean, later on, sometimes you think of something, you know, they wish you, you had thought of, but we do our best to explore whatever ideas you can even possibly think of at the time. I had a question about um, the students that you you know, and the people you're hiring in your office now. And uh, I've noticed in my world that a lot of the people in your generation, though you're still young, were artists before they became, and you know, and drew and sketched. And I'm meeting people in, not necessarily from SVA, but at other schools that 
you know, grew up with the computer and didn't seem to have an art background before they started noodling with an apple. Has that, have you noticed that and has it influenced uh, your hiring decision? Well, I don't know if they usually tell us, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it does depend on how you grew up. I mean, certainly Ivan and I, and even Sagi, who was a couple years younger, um, we grew up drawing and, and still find that drawing is the quickest way to express an idea. I mean, even just to yourself, it doesn't mean you have to display it as a drawing, but it's still, the computer is nowhere near you know, the speed of the hand in terms of doing that or the expressiveness of the hand. So sometimes it, it is a problem. We had one class of students came in, I remember a few years ago, and I had a bunch of really rough uh, marker sketches pinned to the wall for something we were doing. And after the class left, this one guy came back and he said, what program is that? So, I mean, there is a tendency to, you know, think you can do it all on the computer, which you obviously can't. But we try to look at, at everything that someone's done, including drawings and so on. Uh, I'm not sure that answers your question, but um, I, I think you can come at design from many different ways and not necessarily an art background. And design today is such a broad field and there's so many aspects of it uh, that, uh, uh, again, and there have been many successful people who, who came to it from other, other means. And Chris Pullman uh, of WGBH in Boston, I believe, came out of a, you know, just a completely liberal arts background with no design training, but then decided to, to get some. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>